Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Onco Daily Sarcoma Talk podcast. I'm your host, uh, Shushan Hovsepian, a pediatric oncologist. And today we have a very special guest joining us, uh, Stephen Young, the president and CEO of Sarcoma Alliance for Research through Collaboration, SARC. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, let's dive into the conversation. I'd love to hear more about your journey and what like you to become the president and CEO of uh, SARC. And to get started, I would love to hear more. Uh, can you share about your background and what led you to uh, SARC? Well, first of all, I'm not a physician or a scientist. I got into this space um, Almost by accident, I was considering going for uh, uh, an MD or a PhD way back in the day. And I ended up, uh, cutting a long story short, becoming the director of the Clinical Research Center at uh, Cornell University Medical College, now while Cornell. I would say that was, that was one inflection point. And then I shifted over a number of years later at Mount Sinai School of Medicine to do something analogous, but in the adult population at Cornell Pediatric uh, Space. And a, a real pivotal moment for me happened when I was recruited to become the, the inaugural executive director of the Multiple Myeloma Research Consortium, uh, which was being built by uh, a, a very inspirational woman named Kathy Giusti, who is a my, myeloma survivor. And what her mission or her mandate was to uh, get to establish a centralized hub to facilitate multicenter team science collaborations. And so the MMRC, as it became known, uh, ended up driving a lot of collaborations among academic centers, primarily uh, focusing on clinical trials. And by the time I left, we had approximately 15 phase one to three investigator initiated trials underway, plus a handful of industry initiated registrational trials. But I'm, I'm talking about this because it really uh, put me on my current career arc. Uh, after leaving the MMRC, I was recruited into the uh, Dario Lung Cancer Medical Institute and became the president of that that consortium. Again, and lung cancer is obviously a very different cancer than myeloma. And so we, f we focused a bit more and more on the preclinical, early stage scientific development. And then five, four and a half years ago, I was recruited in to become the uh, president and CEO of SARC, which as you indicated, is also known as the Sacoma Alliance for Research Through Collaboration. So I would say those were the two pivotal moments that got me into this position, was I get, becoming the uh, director of the Clinical Research Center and then uh, getting into actually facilitated clinical trials organizations. Thank you so much, Stephen, for sharing that. And uh, to continue, let's hear more about also SARC. What is the mission of SARC? How has it evolved over the years to address the unique challenges in sarcoma research? Well. I as we know, collaboration is key to all of science, and in particular with sarcoma, with which, as everybody who's probably listening to this is aware, are so many subtypes, so many uh, fractionated patient populations, so many investigators and clinicians working in sort of uh, vertical silos of by subtype expertise and and foci. That's part of the story, and the other part of the story, of course, is how to make advancements in a disease that really hasn't had much of, uh, has really fallen a little bit behind some of the other cancers in terms of the advancements. I mentioned lung cancer. Uh, there are so many new therapies proved more effective therapies for lung cancer. Sadly for sarcoma, I think the field has, has struggled. And you know, I won't get into the science because I'm not a scientist, but clearly the, the, the elephant in the room is the, the heterogeneity of the disease. And uh, again, patients and investigators focus pretty much on the verticals. There hasn't been a, a view of sarcoma as a disease in my lay humble opinion. So I, I would say that SARC, SARC's primary focus and mission is to facilitate teen science collaborations among investigators in this space. It's as simple as that. Our goal is to make lung, uh, uh, sarcoma a survival disease across as many subtypes as possible. And to that end, we're established with centralized processes and infrastructures. We have lots of lots of voluntary clinicians, scientists who are all working together and pulling on the oars. Sark's role is to be that fulcrum or a catalyst facilitating these collaborations. And to that end, we've established centralized processes and contracting, which I know is not exciting, but it is a key rate living step in terms of getting studies done. Uh, we have signed a a number of scientific and clinical committees that are driving 
our prioritization process and our project selection process. And then finally, we have centralized infrastructures for trial management. SARC is the regulatory sponsor of our trials. SARC does not raise funds and hand out grants. Our job is to facilitate team science. We all, at least what's known in the United States as the IND, as we sponsor our trials. And to that end, we have all the centralized infrastructures, and I won't go through them. But to be that as it may, think of us almost like a central trials office for an academic center, except across the world. And I'm not trying to be too grandiose on that. Most of our trials are U.S.-centric. However, we're also one of the few organizations that can do global clinical trials, and we have several open right now. Yeah, that's really great. And the work that you are doing is very insightful. Uh, of course, money is very important. Funding is very important to initiate a clinical trial, but also regulations are very uh, difficult to uh, um, handle. So that's a really very important work that you are doing. And I would like to delve uh, deeper and to see what are the key projects and the initiatives that SARC is currently leading to uh, advance the sarcoma research and patient care. So, so, as I mentioned, our clinical trials are, if you will, have been at the core and heart of SARC since its founding in 2003. Um, in my prior answer, I neglected to uh, indicate that SARC was actually founded by the sarcoma investigator community. Not most foundations in the cancer space were founded by patients, quite frankly, or survivors or caregivers. SARC was founded by, and I'll go as far as to say, for the sarcoma investigator community to drive these. Uh, so I, I should have asked, uh, added that in my prior answer. So I, I'd say SARC's primary um, programmatic mix is a mix of clinical trials and uh, preclinical scientific collaborations. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the latter in a moment. Our clinical trials are underway. We have four open right now. Two are enrolling. Two of that, uh, One of them is uh, still international in reach. We have approximately uh, three to five trials. In the pipeline, we plan to launch three trials by the end of 20, two to three trials, excuse me, by the end of 2025. So our clinical trials has been our bread and butter, if you will, our, our basic mandate as an organization to drive forward. And we are increasing the launch rate from approximately one new trial a year to uh, a run rate of about three to four uh, on the next number of years, starting this year, starting in 2025. Um, and that's a, that's possible due to engagement by a lot of many more clinicians and investigators. The other, I'd say the, the other key factor which SARC has embraced is we were primarily, as I mentioned, investigator facing. Um, SARC had pre published a map of our collaborating centers and they were called SARC centers. And over time, it became clearer and clearer to me and to others that patients were using patient advocacy organization referring their patients to our website to find a sarcoma program. And quite frankly, uh, as we looked at the map, or at least I was, my view is the we had to really annotate it much more and make sure that it was a useful list for patients to send there or, or to select and identify. So last year, we launched a sarcoma center's directory, uh, originally called as registry. And I think that's really a, a, a key point to highlight because it's an inflection point of SARC becoming not only a resource for investigators and clinicians and scientists, but also to the patient populations. And to that end, uh, we're expanding it greatly. We're adding a hot, we've added a phone support line answered by a physician. We're adding a whole subtypes directory, uh, which really will break down the subtypes by high level uh, overviews, but importantly, key resources within those subtypes, whether it's sarcoma advocacy organizations and or sarcoma centers that specifically have expertise in that subtype. That's really impressive. And uh, under your leadership, uh, as you mentioned, one of the most significant achievements, could you uh, highlight uh, some as well, uh, the milestones that uh, were uh, achieved during your leadership as well? Besides the increase in pipeline, um, and again, that's not a, uh, a negative comment on my predecessor, uh, Denise Branke, who led SARC from its founding, along with uh, Dr. Larry Baker and many others. I think what we're most proud of is our increase in our in visibility of SARC. Uh, there was a perception that SARC was a closed uh, vessel, that you had to have the secret handshake to know how to work with us. Since then, we've really expanded the reach and, and outreach of SARC to a broader 
uh, uh, investigative community, but also, as we said, to the adv- advocacy community. We launched, uh, under my predecessor, launched the Research Advocacy Council, which are a group of trained research advocates that we embed in our clinical trials. So we've increased that breadth and depth and now actually assign one to two embed a trial, a, a, um, a advocate into every one of our trials. The other uh, thing I think we're proud of is incre- along that theme of increasing visibility is a, our own podcast series called SARC Talk, led by our chief medical officer, Dr. Scott Acuno from Mayo Clinic. We have also expanded our scientific reach. Uh, when I was hired and it was underway when I was being hired, we engaged a chief scientific officer, Dr. Jonathan Fletcher from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in, in Boston, USA, to bring a, a stronger science focus to it. I, I call it SARC science. That's not the official term, but it's really a comp- complement, if you will, our SARC clinical expertise. So again, I think the things we're most proud of are the increase of awareness and reach and breadth and also our depth. Um, uh, SARC was able to, uh, was under my predecessor, awarded a SPOR, a Specialized Program on College of Research Excellence uh, Award. And that I'm only bringing this up because it gives an idea of the the breadth and depth of and skill set of this organization, not just staff, but also our d- a diversified investigator community. And we are uh, hoping to get an- another spore or a similar uh, broad team science program going forward. But again, the themes here are expansion, depth, and above all, focus on impact. Uh, we don't want to do Me Too studies, things that would have happened without us. SARC's so mission and mandate is to drive progress in spaces, places in spaces that would not otherwise have taken place, or if they would, would not have happened as quickly. And I think that's another aspect of this is the word catalyst, SARC, actually accelerates the process. Could we be better? Absolutely. Could we be more impactful? Absolutely. I think everybody who's in the sarcoma space feels the same way. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's it's really interesting. And now I have a hypothetical question. If you look uh, 10 years from now, uh, what milestones or contributions to sarcoma research would you hope to highlight as the organization's greatest success? Well, remembering that I'm a lay person, uh, I will say the debate in many foundations and organizations, research organizations, is do we say the C word? Do we say cure? Uh, is it a bridge too far? Is it too ambitious? And over the years, I realized we have to be aiming for a cure, whatever the cure means, whether it's uh, chronically managed disease, or no matter what, the patients are not dying of their cancers. So I, I would think, in t- I would hope that by t- ten years period, whether SARC did it or not, that there will be much greater so patient survivability, positive outcomes, and perhaps even complete cures in not only the so specific subtypes, but across groups of them, um, and that hopefully SARC played a a supportive perhaps even a pivotal role in accelerating those, those projects forward. Um, as I said, the cure word is a, a, a landmine in many cancers, particularly uh, more recalcitrant cancers like sarcomas and melanomas and some of the others. But we've been seeing extraordinary advancements. And I think sarc- sarcoma has a little fallen by the wayside, I think, due to, the, due to the enemy. We have a very challenging enemy with many different faces. And I think that's what that's what makes SARC a little bit unique as we're across all sarcomas. We don't focus on this. So is that too big a, a bite to take? I don't think so. Um, we're inspired every day by the progress that we're seeing in, in the various spaces. And uh, a couple of our trials undergoing right now that are in uh, getting into publication stage are going to be, I can't, I don't want to reveal any secrets because before they're published, but very, very, very positive results and excited to see what will come out at ASCO. Um, and you'll start hearing more and more about at ASCO and then at the Connected Tissue Oncology Society meeting in this fall. That's uh, a full vision for the future. And uh, it's incredible to hear also the long-term goals, uh, not only for SARC, but also for the sarcoma community. Uh, this was a very short but uh, very effective uh, discussion on uh, the incredible work that SARC doing. And uh, thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, taking the time uh, to be here. And uh, thank you to our listeners uh, for being with us uh, again. And we will see you next time. Thank well, you so can much. I one more point? Yeah, I sure. I mentioned earlier that there's this perception of SARC as being primarily a U.S.-based organization. I would encourage 
investigators, clinicians, patients, whoever they might be outside the U.S. to reach out to us. We are completely and utterly uh, interested in collaborating on a global stage, um, and there is no barriers to do so, and we really would encourage you to reach out. And to that end, we're establishing an international reach with with potentially affiliates in, in certain countries or at least affiliated investigators and scientists. So we're not all about the U.S., that's wonderful to hear, actually. Yeah, because uh, th there are a lot of organizations that uh, limit only uh, to U.S. and it's very uh, helpful to know that you are very international and global. Thank you for sharing that Thank as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your host the hosting. Thank you for having us. Okay. Bye bye. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.